With the transition period now underway and the agendas of the EU and UK occupied by other matters, the possibility of a no-deal outcome at the end of 2020 seems to be increasing, especially with UK government reaffirming on several occasions that the deadline on the 31st of December is final. While the topic of no-deal Brexit has already been discussed extensively, including by us, these predictions, leaked documents and expert reports have primarily focused on what will be gone if the UK leaves without a deal. Today, however, we're going to focus on what will remain if such a thing happens, and why certain mechanisms will prevent the UK from being fully isolated from the EU, even after a no-deal Brexit. This is mainly due to the World Trade Organization and complex international trade law, which we'll break down for you in this video. Before we dive in, I wanted to highlight that we have a few new items on the TLDR store, including a whole bunch of new button badges, new magnets, and the reintroduction of the mystery pin badge, where we'll send you over a random design for nearly half the standard price. Check out these items and a bunch of other stuff over in the TLDR store. So let's start by briefly taking a look at a no-deal scenario. If by the end of the year, negotiations between the UK and EU haven't reached a conclusion on a trade deal between the two, and either of the parties refuses to extend the deadline, the UK is out of the EU without a deal. At that point, the UK's rights to the EU's four freedoms of goods, people, services and capital will no longer be, nor will the UK be subjected to any EU law whatsoever. Furthermore, the UK will no longer have to pay contributions to the Union, while the Union will no longer grant the benefits of its subsidy and management programmes to the UK. In short, the two sides will part ways. However, the English Channel will not become an Iron Curtain, so some things will continue to exist. This is because both the UK and the EU as a whole are members of the World Trade Organisation. The WTO is an international organisation which almost every country in the world is a member of. Within the WTO, contracting states are subject to agreements they've made in relation to international trade. The World Trade Organisation is a collection of agreements as well as an organisation where contracting states come together to discuss the application of rules, monitor each other, settle disputes and negotiate new deals and amendments. The main agreements are the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade, or GATT, and the General Agreement on Trade and Services, or GATS. But there is a total of 21 agreements applicable to World Trade Organization members, across all kinds of trade topics. Some of these rules are already very old, with the first negotiations for GATT dating from the 1944 Bretton Woods Conference. Originally, there were just the trade agreements, mostly within rich countries. But over the years, so many countries have joined that in 1995, it was decided to make a proper organisation, the World Trade Organisation. The rules of the WTO are aimed at trade liberalisation and the removal of cross-border barriers among all WTO members. Such barriers can range from tariffs to technical procedures, from quotas to public policy requirements, and from local taxes to government subsidies. Anything that changes something in the market and affects trade is, in principle, covered. These rules don't really stipulate what a state must do, mainly what a state must not do, because the idea is that global trade should be liberalised as much as possible to guarantee maximum economic efficiency and best customer prices. As you might sense, the idea of market economics is not without controversy and is often at odds with a nation's desire to protect certain local areas from a public policy point of view. For example, in the UK, many fear that a trade deal between the UK and US will lead to the growth of the US's big pharmaceutical companies and seriously harm the functioning of the NHS and its abilities to buy medicines. But the controversies relate to basically any public policy, including labour rights, environmental protection, employment levels, public health, land, culture, energy, you name it. If you want us to do a video on some of the key problems that trade agreements pose to public health, then do let us know in the comments below. Across the agreements, there are four rules which protect global free trade. The first is called market access. Any WTO member must remove any rules or barriers that disrupt trading goods or services as much as possible. The second is called national treatment, meaning that in like circumstances, any suppliers must be treated at least as well as any local suppliers trading like products. 
Third, the transparency rule states that every nation must inform the rest of the WTO when it makes rules that affect trade with their nation and must help and comply with the monitoring of these rules. The final one is arguably the most interesting, and it's the so-called most favourite nation rule. The most favoured nation rule, or MFN, avoids countries treating each other better than other WTO members. The principle is that every time a country makes a trade deal with another nation, granting that other country the benefit, that benefit must also be granted to all other WTO members. Each WTO member must be treated as the most favoured nation. To give an example, imagine the UK makes an agreement with the US, allowing US investors to set up their businesses in the UK without having to abide by certain rules. That benefit must then be granted to investors from every WTO country. Of course, there are some exceptions which exist, which allow nations to make their own customs unions, like the EU, and trade agreements, or get waivers. Some of these big trade deals and negotiations recently include the TTIP between the US and EU, NAFTA in North America, Mercosur in South America, the TPPA among Pacific countries, and CETA between the EU and Canada. The rules that allow these kind of big deals are very complex and require some hardcore legal skills to fully understand. But put simply, agreements among countries are allowed as long as 1. They do not on the whole raise barriers to the rest of the WTO, but only reduce them from the party in the specific deal, and 2. If they cover substantially all trade between the parties. In essence, this is to avoid everyone making many agreements to circumvent WTO rules for the types of goods and services they wish to protect. So, to sum up, all WTO members must aim to prevent barriers to trade from emerging and treat foreign traders just as good as their own. They must be transparent about their laws and grant benefits to everyone, not just their friends. You may at this point feel like you know where this video is going. The UK may be leaving the EU, but it's not leaving the World Trade Organization anytime soon. So, some of the benefits that EU member states grant their own citizens will also have to be granted to the UK. Think of it this way. The fact that the EU and, say, New Zealand on the other side of the globe don't have a trade deal doesn't mean that there's no trade between traders in Europe and New Zealand. There is this mutual protection of traders because both are WTO members, and thus, WTO rules, like most favoured nation, continue to apply. This will also apply between the EU and UK. British traders will continue to be welcome within the EU and still receive a large degree of equal treatment. Neither of them can subject each other to massive tariffs or discriminate between local and foreign suppliers. These things are all regulated in WTO law that continues to apply unless either the UK or EU were to leave the World Trade Organization, which is basically unthinkable. Of course, when the UK was a member of the EU, the benefits granted between the two went much further than those coming from the WTO. Think, for example, of agricultural subsidies. And if there were to be a trade deal between the two, it would also guarantee that there would be much more mutual protection of traders than the WTO rules guarantee. But beyond the trade deal, these international trade rules will continue to apply and make sure that trade between the two will continue to exist and be profitable. It's because of this reason that the picture of a large wall between the UK and EU and the absence of a trade deal is inaccurate. Which scenario will be better for the UK is based on your own opinion, and whether you think it's more important for the UK to be able to regulate its own market, at least up until the point when WTO rules draw the line, versus the price of uncertainty and reduced trade. We hope that this video has clarified the no deal scenario a bit, and why the end of the UK's membership of the EU will not mean isolation of the UK from the EU. Do you think no deal is still as bad as you thought? Which scenario do you think will be best? And should the government still do its absolute best to avoid no deal, even if it means extending the transition period? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. And of course, you can also get involved on Discord. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. And if you want more from us, you can find us across all social networks simply by searching for TLDR News. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.